last January, and it was just goosebumps. Both arms, legs, be prepared. My last session turned into therapy. I cried a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to cry this hour for a very different reason, because it's just going to be amazing. So here's how it's going to work. Steve is going to show us some things that he's got going on on the piano, and then we're going to do some Q&A. But I don't even need to introduce you. Just please welcome this wonderful man. Thanks, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to basically what we're going to do today, or, or what I've been asked to do, is to talk a bit about writing for musical theater and specifically writing songs for musical theater and um, some thoughts that, that I have about that, this. Um, I do want to say, I don't know if any, I, I, I did this sort of um, talk or whatever, presentation um, at the Guild in New York about six months or so ago. So um, to anybody who happened to be there then, I apologize for the repetition. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, yeah, here we go. Uh, and I, I'm going to try to barrel through a little bit because I want to try to get, to, to have sufficient time for um, questions and answers. Uh, I thought both um, in, in my session yesterday and the wonderful session that I attended with Emily Mann and Doug Wright, the, the questions are so um, provocative and inspiring and intelligent um, that I want to leave as much time as possible for them because you guys um, ask things in a, in a thoughtful and uh, articulate way that, that we may not have thought of, but it, it opens up uh, you know, uh, ideas and, and, and thoughts to talk about. So I want to, I want to make sure we have enough time for that. Uh, so yes, I'm going to barrel a little bit. Can everybody hear me? I don't need to use the mic, do I? Are you guys all right in the back of the room? Yeah, okay. Yeah. If, if you start not being able to hear me and you want me to pick up the mic, I will. Um, but I, I won't unless I see little hands go up in the back. All right, so I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, what really, what is a musical theater song? And how does it, how, why is it different from a pop song or an art song? or a standalone song. And a lot of this will be stuff that you already know, um, but I think it, it never hurts to sort of articulate these things. I found when I actually try to write things down and, and make a little list about um, what qualities to consider for a musical theater song, it was, it, it's always good to, to sort of think about these things and, and articulate them. So um, apologies if, if some of this seems too rudimentary to some of you. Um, so theater songs, is a, what really differentiates a theater song from a, a pop song or an art song? And, and, and what, really what are some of the functions of theater songs? What can they do? We talked about this a little bit yesterday in one of the questions. And I have a few things um, that I thought of. Uh, and one of them was something we, we mentioned yesterday, which is that they can tell the story that you're telling itself faster and more stylishly than a succession of scenes. Um, that that they're they can be useful in terms of taking a, a, a big hunk of storytelling that needs to be done and organizing it in a way that, um, that speeds through it and hurdles the plot forward and makes it more entertaining. A, a very good example of this is Weekend in the Country from uh, Little Night Music. If you think about how much information is contained in that song, how much is being set up, how many relationships, I mean basically what you're looking at is getting a whole bunch of characters to gather together for the second act, basically. If you thought about how that would be in just a scene, not so interesting, but it's done so stylishly and with such verve and wit in, in the number that basically this huge amount of exposition um, is accomplished in, in an extremely entertaining way. 
And, and I've tried to select in, in a lot of these examples, examples of my own work, um, you know, uh, which I, we won't characterize with whether it's done well or not, but just in <laughs> ways. Um, so in, in Wicked, the whole dancing through life sequence, um, which began in the, in the early uh, stages of working on that show, that was four separate scenes and at times three separate numbers. And it was this great, big, clumsy mass in the middle of the first act where we had to introduce characters and set up relationships. And it was just taking forever and slogging down the whole show. And when I finally was able to organize it in, in my head uh, under the, the rubric of one number, Dancing Through Life, um, it just hurtled the show forward. So that's a good thing um, to think about. <coughs> You know, if you, if you have a section of, of story in your show um, that is taking a long time and you, you want to try and push through it and, and, and energize it, um, you might think about how you might organize it as a musical number. I mean, some of the other ways are, are, are obvious and, 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 or maybe more obvious. Obviously, we use theater songs to illuminate character, um, to tell us who, who the people are, What's, what's driving them, and, and it, I've heard it said, and I, and I agree with this, that a character in a musical doesn't really live until he or she sings. Mm -hmm. um, that if they're just existing as a character who only speaks, they're not, an import, they're not that important a character. Um, an obvious example, I mean, there, there are tons of examples of songs which eliminate character, but you know, the one that came first to mind for me was a Henry Higgins' song, Why Can't a Woman Be More Like a Man? Mm -hmm. You know, once he does that song, you know so much about that guy, and it, and it helps to drive him through the rest of the show. And there are tons of uh, other examples like that. Um, obviously, music contains a, a, its own energy, and sometimes in a show, you just want to kick up the energy. Um, and if you think about it, virtually every, num every choreographed number in every musical is basically doing that. Sometimes it's telling story, but it has the corollary responsibility of kicking up the energy. I mean, an example from, from Wicked is One Short Day, um, which, which was written pretty much for that purpose, just to have a, a joyous moment and, and kick the energy up before we went into some more serious stuff at, towards the end of the first act. And yes, there's an event. I think it's important to have an event, which is the bonding of the friendship of the two girls. It's where the end of the number of One Short Day is they declare that they are best friends. But that's something that really could have happened in a line or a very brief scene. Basically, the purpose of that number is, is about providing energy. And also, of course, if you're doing a musical where, um, where you have an important theme or, or um, an, an idea that you want to um, express, then that's also well expressed in musical numbers. An obvious example would be tradition from Fiddler on the Roof. And often these numbers are, in fact, the opening number um, in, the, in the Jerry Robbins way of, of uh, structuring a musical. But they can happen late. If you think of South Pacific, there's you've got to be carefully taught. You know, we're sort of the message of the show or a thematic content. Um, and it's a way of delivering it without being as heavy-handed as if somebody made a speech, or as dry as if somebody came out and sort of told you this. Again, the music m makes it go down more easily and, and, and gives it a... The most delightful way. Yeah, the most delightful way. <laughs> exactly right. Okay. So what are some other characteristics about a theater song? What does it need? Well, in a, as in a scene or a monologue, it's good if it has an action. Somebody is trying to do something to someone else, or to him or, or herself. They're trying to convince, or to persuade, or to comfort, or to galvanize, or to charm. Or it's good, it, as in acting, if it, there can be an active verb in the number that helps drive it. Because, um, and, and you know, obviously, so many obvious examples, but the two that I wrote down quickly are some people from Gypsy. 
if you think about how that is set up, basically it's a number that illuminates character. It's telling you who this person is. It's telling you what kind of a person she is. But it's set within the context of she's trying to get her father to give her $88. And the fact that that's how it's set up, as opposed to her just coming out and declaring, gives it a kind of dramatic drive. Um, Another example that I thought of, and it's, and, it, and it's one that might not come to mind so much, but actually if you think about like Music of the Night in Phantom of the Opera, rather than just this character coming out and you know, singing a, this lush ballad, he has a goal, which is to, to persuade the girl to let him be her mentor. And the fact that, it, that it's framed within that motivation gives it a, gives it a drive. And even when a character is on stage singing by him or herself, it's good if you can find some kind of drive so it's not just declarative, not just um, a declaration of a state of being. Um, and sometimes that's tricky to find, but I think it's a good thing to think about for theater songs. Um, I remember that uh, Larry O'Keefe, when he was working on Bat Boy, told me that he sort of had a policy that, that he would never write a song for someone to sing by him or herself alone on stage. He always insisted on them singing to somebody else in order to, to want to do something. Um, you know, that's obviously a, a, a rule that I've broken on many an occasion, and I'm not sure I agree with him, but I report it to you because it was very provocative to me when he said that. And I understood the theatrical motivation that, uh, that led him to say that. And I, thought, I think it's a useful thing to think about even if you're dealing with solos. Because theater songs, therefore, have to move forward. They finish in a different place than where they start. Um, and that's, I think, really the chief differentiation of them between pop songs, which are essentially a, a declaration, um, and, and they make their entire declaration more or less at the beginning of the song, and then they stay there. Um, you know, I, I, I use my friend Dean's song, Fame, as an example. If you think about that song, you get to the first chorus, you're not really listening too much to the, the, to the opening lyrics, and then you get to the first chorus, and, and it says, Fame, I'm going to live forever. That's the whole song. And, and meant to be that way. And, and everything that follows that is that idea. And you don't learn anything more at the end of the song then it's been declared right there. And that's a pop song, um, and deliberately structured to be that way. That doesn't work so well for theater songs. Even if you're staying in the same place, um, if you're doing a, a verse and chorus song, as, as I often have done, such as Corner of the Sky, um, you still want to, at least in those verses, be moving forward. And, and maybe in the final chorus, take another step forward if you can. Um, and it's, I think this requirement is why pop writers so frequently have trouble writing for the theater. Even the greatest pop writers, because they just don't think in these terms. They don't think about forward motion in, in a song. Um, and songs in a musical, therefore, they exist in time, in many senses of, of that word time. And that, I think, also differentiates them. For one thing, at, if, if they're functioning at their best, they need to be sung right now, at the moment they are sung. Something has happened to spur that character right at that moment to sing that song. Um, couldn't have been sung an hour ago, can't be sung tomorrow, now. Um, and there, there are so many examples, again, I mean, if you think of a love song like Maria from West Side Story, still, that is a song that's a response to something that's just happened. Um, and if he sang the song, the, the event hadn't happened yesterday, so he couldn't sing it then. And if he sang it tomorrow, it, it wouldn't have the same heat and energy. Um, I just met a girl named Maria. It just happened. Um, the Mistress's song in Evita, a song that has absolutely no business working. It breaks <laughs> every single rule. It's one of my favorite songs. Um, it's a character that you don't care about, you're never going to see again. But it's so compelling about being in the moment um, that you, you want to spend time with that character. 
and, it, and there's a thing about the lyric of the mistress's song that, that I admire very much, and it's sort of what I call the Tim Rice trick. Um, and uh, it's something that I admire about Tim Rice's lyric writing, and, and I've kind of tried to steal it since I noticed it, which is, <laughs> which is characters wh where, where you're in the character's head, and they're hearing their own thoughts and sometimes amending them. For instance, in the mistress's song, she says, um, I think it's in a month or two, or in a, I forget what the exact, a week or two, but um, even if I'm mis slightly misquoting it, she says, um, in a week or two, I'll be fine, I know. Well, maybe not that fine, but I'll survive anyhow. That moment is thrilling to me. That's what I mean about being right in the moment. So much in the moment that she's correcting her own thoughts. She's responding to her own ideas. And I find that's very theatrical. And again, not something that we hear very much in, in pop songs. Um, other example, I've grown accustomed to her face about a song that's happening right now and is sort of tracking the characters' thoughts which are all over the place and kind of spilling in on themselves. You know, such a brilliantly constructed theater song. And even though it became very popular, um, it's clearly a theater song and not a pop song. And also, I mean, this is an obvious thing to say, but I think it's good to think about. A song... A theater song is received by the listener in real time. It's coming by your ear, and you have to get it. So even if you're not, and, and sometimes you can't hear every word, and sometimes you know the, the character turns up stage and you miss a little bit. So as writers, we have to be aware of that, that, it's, that the, it has to deliver itself um, right then, and, and um, no one's going to go back and listen to it again and get it again. Like, you know, I, I know with some of my favorite pop writers, like, like Joni Mitchell, for instance, or in fact the new Paul Simon album, and you listen to it the first time and you're like, hmm, okay. And then sort of like three days later, you start, start to think, oh, that song, I want to hear it again. And then you listen to it a few more times and it, it grows on you and you kind of get that's not a theater song, <laughs> and that you can't be having that happen in the theater. Um, and so you have to think about, you know, the uses of repetition, the uses of simplicity, the uses of where you give the ear time to rest before it has to hear again. Um, if you look at how, you know, Steve Sondheim is, is uh, thought of as somebody who, um, with a lot of words and a lot of lyrics and you have to keep up and all of that is true but what he's very skillful at is repetition and giving the audience a chance to rest before it has to hear something else and it's, I think it's, it's helpful to take a look at his work in, in that regard and see how artfully he does that. You don't want the audience to either feel left behind but you also don't want to be ahead of the song and some of that has to do with how things are structured. I saw a show recently um, in New York, and, and I found that I was constantly ahead of the songs, and I started to think, well, why is that? And I realized that the structure, the lyric structure of every song was exactly the same. It was all uh, A, B, C, D. It was all da 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 tree, da 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 and me. You know, and so what started to happen for me was that when I got to tree, my mind was already thinking, oh, that's where it's going to go. You don't want your audience to be doing that. So you want to think about, yes, you want the satisfaction that a rhyme scheme can deliver, the, the ability to land things that rhymes can deliver, particularly jokes are always better if, if they're delivered with a true rhyme, but you, but you have to be able to stay ahead of the audience. And some, some of that has to do with how you, how you structure your lyrics. Um, music, as we said yesterday, it, it tends to stretch time, except in the cases where, uh, of a thing like Weekend in the Country where you're trying to speed up time. But mostly what you're doing is you're taking a moment and you're stretching it out and sitting in that moment and delving into it. Um, that songs take, just take longer than a conversation or a scene. So you want to make sure that it's worth, that moment is worth stretching the time for. Um, because by <coughs> making it a song, you're announcing that this is a moment that we want, that, that, that we want to look at, that we want to spend more time with. 
Uh, yeah, so you have to be, make sure it's a mo the moment is worth stretching. And then the other thing, which again is obvious to say, but, but I think well to say out loud, theater songs are of course affected by what's come before them and what comes after them. So that, um, you know, you want a sense of your overall structure. You want to know, in fact, if you need to kick up the energy, um, if, if you can do a ballad in this spot, or, or whether, uh, or if this is a moment to, uh, for introspection, um, when to build to a big hand, and so on. These are things, you know, you want to consider as you're dealing with each individual song, that, that it's a piece within, within a bigger frame, within, uh, within a, a longer form. Um, and again, I've seen a lot of things founder because they're perfectly good songs, but they're, they're not working well enough based on what's come before, or they're undercutting what, what comes afterwards. Um, speaking of building to a hand, that's another thing, um, big difference with theater songs, have an awareness of a finish. Um, and there's something, and more obviously, more often than not, they build to hand. And in my ASCAP workshops that I do, that's, I think, the thing that I notice more than anything as, as a failing of um, writers, less experienced writers, is they don't know how to finish their songs. And a lot of times I hear a terrific song and you can sit there with the audience at the reading or the workshop hearing the song and they get through 99% of the song and it's terrific and then at the very end they lose it. And, it and, and you can just feel the air go out of the room a little bit. And so instead of getting a great big hand, it gets a, a mild hand. Sometimes it's as simple as the person's holding the last note too long or or it sort of stops uh, abruptly, or, or there isn't that little extra kick at the end that announces it's coming to an end. So you want to be aware of, of building to the end, for the most part. And if you don't, you want to, you want to do it on purpose. You know, you want, so the audience feels that they were in good hands and you meant that. I mean, an example of a, uh, I mean, there are many examples of songs that, that build to, just at the end, they have the little extra kick. Um, you know, I, I thought of Adelaide's Lament. This whole wonderful long song, it's so delightful, but Lesser was, you know, enough of a theater guy that he didn't just be like, okay, I, I did and I told my jokes, and now she'll just say, a person can develop a cold, done hand. At the very end, he just puts a little coda on. You know, from a lack of community property and a feeling she's getting too old, a person can develop a bad, bad, cold, huge hand. Huge hand. <laughs> and it's just that little thing, but, but to be aware of it. You know, um, I, I try to do this, uh, you know, I try and be very aware of this. I use triple rhymes a lot, probably too much. I'm actually trying to wean myself away from it. <laughs> but, but right at the very end, you know, when I sort of, wrote down, um, you know, like the end of popular. Again, a very, very long number, which stops in the middle for a whole comedy routine, etc. But then at the very end, just kicking up the ending, you know, uh, um, so, that, so that after this whole five minute or however long it is thing, it, that the hand supports it, you know, that, that you know, when, when she sings, uh, you know, at the, at the very end, you know, You'll be popular, just not quite as popular as me, and there's this whole big rhyme that's built up before it, and that little twist at the end helps to keep it, keep it up. There's, you just want to deliver a little something new at the very end and let the audience know, and we're finishing here. And it makes a huge difference. And as I say, also be very aware of, you don't want the, you don't want the singer to run out of air. You, you know, before the end of the note, you don't, and so on. You really want to pay attention to, you know, what's called the button of the number. It makes, it makes a big difference. A um, couple of other quick things to talk about. Um, the use of motifs, which is something I, I'm, I'm very fond of, and um, I think is very helpful in, in theater songs, because again, you're talking about a big form, so repetition is very helpful, motifs and reprises. Um, you know, I, uh, obvious example, and I, rem I remember when I saw Gypsy for the first time and the use of I Had a Dream and how extraordinarily effective I felt that was. It's the very first thing you hear in the overture before you even know what that is. And, and the way it's repeated and the way it means something different each time was 
uh, so influential on me that I just do it over and over again. And I'm going to do a little uh, presentation in a minute about the writing of The Wizard and I, which I apologize to those of you who have already heard me do this. But one of the things about that was that the very first thing that I had was the unlimited motif before I had anything else. In fact, almost before I had anything in the, in the show, you know, I had, I had, that had sort of come to me. I knew I wanted something where, it, where the character started in a place and at the end, because she's come to a different place, there's something different about that motif, which we'll talk about a little bit in, in a minute. Um, subtext. Very, I, I think, really important in, in theater songs. Um, much more so than, than in pop songs. Pop songs tend to be to wear their, their hearts and their thoughts on their sleeve. Exactly what they're saying is exactly what they're feeling. There's no secret that the character has that, that we don't know that's not declared in the song, both musically or, or lyrically. Um, and so many great theater songs, that's not true of. That, that the audience either knows more than the character does, or the character is keeping something they think, but, but we see through it. Um, going all the way back to songs, think about songs like People Will Say We're In Love, or, or If I Loved You, you know, um, which we tend to think it was like flat out love songs, but really think about how, how clever that was, that they're, they're declaring, it's obvious that they're crazy about one another, and all they're doing is saying, I'm not. You know, and that's a very bald and obvious example of, of subtext. You know, um, again, if you you know you you think of a song like like the ladies who lunch, you know, which appears to be a woman celebrating people, and and um, and the song is so underneath it, it's so full of rage and self-loathing. This is a character who hates herself, and the more she mocks other people the more it's clear that really what she does is hate herself. And it's that subtext that gives it its, its enormous power and its charge. And at the end, she's saying something so celebratory. She's saying, everybody rise, and it gets angrier and angrier and angrier until it's really ugly, because she's so angry. And it's the anger that, that the subtext of that anger that makes that thrilling theatrically. Um, you know, I was trying to think of, of a quick example from my own work, and you know, I was thinking of the song from Wicked, I Couldn't Be Happier, where a character is just kind of, you know, in telling everybody how happy she is and how her whole life has worked out, and the more she talks about it, the more heartbroken she is and the more devastated she is. And, 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 but, the, but the words are saying something completely different, and, and the music, and there's, a, there's a, a, a sort of disconnect between what the music is telling you and what the words are saying that, at least my intention was, that's very theatrical. So I urge you to consider that, to consider about subtext and about what is something that the audience knows that the character doesn't, or that the character's trying to hide, um, but comes through anyway, sometimes in the music but not in the words. Because um, that's, that's a useful tool to think about. Um, and then one other thing that I want to quickly talk about is how the music tells the story without, can tell the story without the words. Um, and I think in a lot of great songs, uh, theater songs, that, that is true. Um, and it's something that I, I didn't used to think about so much. Um, and then my good friend Craig Cornelia here um, wrote a song for um, the show working called Joe. And um, it's about a guy who is retired. Um, and the entire Again, this is the use of music as subtext. Everything he's saying is about how happy his life is and how busy his life is. But when you hear this music, it's, it's extremely simple and repetitive. And the repetition of this little phrase, okay, I'll probably play it wrong, but, but it just keeps going. And it's just that over and over again. And then he's talking about how full his life is. But the repetition of that is heartbreaking. And when, when I heard that, and I thought, oh, he's telling a whole story in the music. He's giving me the, if I didn't speak English, I would know so much about this character from what the music is telling me. 
And I think a lot of times as composers, we don't really think about that. We don't think of our job as being tell the emotional story of the character in as deep a sense as, as, as I think Craig did in, in the song Joe. Um, and it's just a good thing to think about. You know, I, I, I wrote down some, some other songs, um, you know, again, like Not Getting Married in Company. You don't have to speak English to hear how his, to hear that this character is hysterical um, in both senses of the word, or or Wheels of a Dream from um, uh, 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 from Ragtime. You know, you don't have to understand the words to that music is so inspiring and and tear inducing and everything. You can just hear the aspiration in that music. Um, so yeah, I just think that that when we're approaching a, a theater song, as composers, you want to think about what if, what, if the, what if one day the audience is full of people who don't speak English or speak whatever language the show is in, how much of the story, the emotional story, can I, can I tell just with music? Um, as opposed to, you know, what we sometimes do is like, oh, that's a good tune, or that's a cool riff, or whatever. Okay, so. <laughs> These were a bunch of things that I sort of wanted to throw at you. Um, and then I'm going to do a little dog and pony show here because, as advertised. <laughs> <laughs> but then, <laughs> but then um, you know, we'll, we'll try and leave time for questions. So, so this is something that I, I've done a few, uh, a few times. And, and my apologies to people who've, who've heard me do this before. But I, I, wanted, I, I, I wanted to share. Um, how a, a specific number got written, and a number which has proven for me to be um, to be very, very successful theatrically, which is the the uh, first song uh, that the character of Elpo the sings in Wicked, which is The Wizard and I. Um, and I just wanted to share with you because you know we go to see shows, and if things are working, we just assume, oh, that's what was always there, and. <laughs> We don't really think, we, we may not be aware of the, of the painful process that, that led and, and how often one makes, um, you know, goes down cul-de-sacs and, and yeah. makes missteps, etc. And, and just to sh in, in the spirit of Misery Loves Company, I thought I would share that. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, as you guys know, um, because it's become so well known that everybody now knows about the I Want song. This has now become, you know, so publicly available that we have to hide it. Uh, we can't just write an I Want song anymore because everyone knows we're going to do it. Um, as you guys know, most musicals, um, the vast majority of musicals, and particularly story-oriented musicals, have, with, as one of their first three numbers, uh, a song which has come to be known as the I Want song because the leading character comes out and basically he or she tells you what he or she wants. And then we spend the rest of the show watching them try to get it and, and come up against obstacles. And there's a real use for this song. There's a reason why it's become uh, so familiar that it's a cliche, because it helps to drive the entire show. And a lot of times you see a show, and, and, and if that's not there, it's not clear, you, you're kind of lost. You're like, well, who's this show about? And who do I care about? And what am I rooting for? And the I Want song helps to, to answer those questions in a way that allows the audience to take the journey. So when I was working on Wicked and I was thinking about um, the I Want song uh, for Elphaba, uh, I, I had an idea for, to do a song called Making Good. And I like to start uh, with a title, if I can find one, it's very helpful for me in organizing a song if I know what it's called. Um, and so I had this notion about um, doing a song called Making Good, and I, I like that title for many reasons, well, for two reasons. I like it because I like titles that mean more than one thing, um, like the title for good. You know, Making Good, obviously, it means both succeeding and literally making good. And so I found the title attractive, and I like the idea that a character that we know is going to become the most wicked person in her world starts out by having the desire to make good. Um, so uh, starting with that, a couple of things. First of all, as I said, I wanted to, I, I, I wanted to have a motif that changed. And, um, and so from the very beginning, and in every incarnation of the song, this motif occurred. And I, I'll tell you, I tell you about it because when I actually illustrate, I'm not going to play it. 
all three times because that would just be so tedious. But so I came up with the idea that when she starts, she's so full of um, hope and uh, um, conviction that things are going to work out for herself, that things are going to be unlimited. And so I thought of the, the, the word unlimited, and she, she always sang in every version of the song, Unlimited, my future is unlimited. And that was, was there in every incarnation. It was one of the very first things that, um, that I wrote for the show. And, and you, most of people know by now that you know it's Somewhere Over the Rainbow. It's the tune to Somewhere Over the Rainbow. But it just changes the, the etc. And that was just like, you know, a little little joke. <laughs> I was so thrilled when people started to find this. So anyway, okay. But anyway, to go back to making good. So um, we have this idea that uh, Winnie, Winnie Holtzman, uh, the, my book writer, and, and myself, the idea was that there was going to be this scene, like the second scene in the show, and the character of Elphaba was going to get on a train to go to school. Uh, full of, and, and there was a little scene beforehand where people sort of made fun of her and she yelled at them and then she sang the song and this was going to be her I Want song. And I'm going to play, I won't play the whole thing for you, but I'll play you a little bit. So it went like this. <laughs> some friends and you just feel how it's working and it's always horrifying and revelatory because you go in <laughs> thinking like, my show is perfect. <laughs> and then you sit at the reading and you think, nothing works. <laughs> so, and, and the truth lies somewhere in between there. But anyway, we did the song at, at, at a few readings and, and again, I could just feel it was not really landing. It was okay, got a nice response, but other things were landing much better. And I just thought, but this is the leading character. And this is the first time we're hearing from, from her. This, this has to land, or we're in trouble. Um, and then we, uh, we uh, around about this time, we cast Adina Menzel on the lead. And so I was thinking about Adina, and that she has this kind of streety, yes, exactly right, edgy personality. And I thought, well, maybe the song needs to be a little, little tougher, et cetera. Um, so I wrote a whole other version of a song called Making Good. And um, the notion was still, she gets on a train, she's going off to school, and, um, and I'll play just a teeny tiny bit of, of, of that for you. Can you all hear me when I do the lyrics back there? Great, I'm trying to play quite softly because I, I don't have a mic. Okay, so um, this is a little bit of the, the second version of Making Good. Uh, yeah. Someday, someday, you 
So we did this in a, the next couple of readings with Adina doing it. Just felt like we'd moved sideways. Didn't really feel like it was any better. It was just different. And um, my son Scott, who's a terrific director and a great dramaturg, came to the second reading. And um, so I was talking to him afterwards, and I said, you know, that song, Making Good, I, I just, it, does, it doesn't really work, does it? And he was like, no, it's not working at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I've done two versions, and I think they're actually pretty good songs. I, I don't know what's going on. And he was like, the whole idea is wrong. <laughs> he said, first of all, you just can't do that. You can't have some character get on a train and talk about what she's going to, what she wants. That feel, I feel like I'm so ahead of the story. I've seen that a million times. I just think you need to cut the whole scene. He said, what you need to do, I think, is earn the right for her to sing. So I would just suggest you start with her at school, and she does something that... Um, that creates a response, and then she sings about that. And, you know, I went to elaborate explanations about why that wouldn't work. And <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't sing for 20 minutes into the show, and it just was, you know, you, wasn't the way you do a music. But the whole point of, uh, of having readings and, and being a developmental process, and this is something I think it's really important to remember, is you might as well try it, because you can always retreat. You know, we tend to think, we get scared, and we think that it's like, you know, um, Etch-a-Sketch. And one time you shake it up and do something new, and you can never get it back again. But you can. And, and that's happened to me frequently on shows where you try something and finally you say, like, you know what, we were right the first time. Let's just go back to that. So you can always try something new. Okay, so um, I talked to Winnie about this, and we, um, and she said, well, you know, if you really think about it, what do we know about Oz? What do we know that everybody in Oz wants? They want to see the wizard. And they want the wizard to fix whatever's wrong with them. So probably that's what she should want. Um, and then, uh, by then, of course, it was, uh, we knew that what the plot was, and so that was clearly the right thing to do. And then the other thing that I want to share with you is that, um, you know, we, we now had Adina, and I remembered something from a chorus line when I saw a chorus line, that, um, that I think is very smart theatrically, which is when I saw a chorus line for the first time, um, and I, I saw it downtown, and I didn't know anything about it because it hadn't opened yet, and I'm watching this great show, and at the end, you know, they do this really long curtain call where they all come out in, like, their top hats and their gold lame, and I remembered that when they came out, at first in the gold lame, I sort of thought, oh, now they're all going to come downstage and do a kick line. And I was very smug and, you know, <laughs> feeling manipulated and all this. And, um, and so I'm watching the curtain call, and they're dancing around, and they all come down a big straight line, but they don't do a kick line. And then they dance around some more. So now I'm watching it and thinking, whoa, they're going to do a kick line, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then they dance around some more, great choreography, come downstage again, no kick line. Mm -hmm. Then they dance around some more. By this time, I'm like, where's the kick line? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, at the end, this, core, this, this curtain call goes on for like eight minutes or something, you know. You want it to go on for 20. At the very end, the lights are coming down, they all get in a big line, and they kick. Big kick line. I'm the first one out of my chair. <laughs> <laughs> and so, needless to say, I thought about this afterwards, and I realized that Michael Bennett did something really smart, which I share with you which is he took the obligatory moment and he made you wait for it until you were grateful that it came. <laughs> really smart, theatrically. Um, and so in thinking about this song, I thought, well, it's Adina. Everybody knows there's going to be a great big belt and whatever. What if I just save that for the very, very end? And so, it, and so it's not till the end that that big belt happens. Okay, so here are all the things that get put together. Um, good, we still will have a little time for questions. Um, she, whole new idea, um, new title, uh, and the idea of delaying the, the, uh, the big moment until, until late in the game. Um, 
And so, as you guys probably know, what happens is she goes to school, she does an inadvertent act of magic, um, it, it, it attracts the attention of the headmistress of the school, who says, I'm going to take you under my wing and teach you to uh, magic, and if you really work hard, someday, maybe you'll be able to work in the service of the wizard himself. And this is the first time in her life that is a song that must happen now, as opposed to a song time in her life. For the first time in her life, someone has believed in her and offered her something that has never occurred to her before. And she sings in response to that song, uh, to that idea. All right, I'm not going to do the, the endless number, but I'll, I'll do enough so we like finish the dog and pony show on a satisfying note. <laughs> okay, so first of all, the intro, as you hear, is that train song too. I like the tune and, you know, just recycle it. <laughs> Did that really just happen? Have I actually understood this weird quirk I tried to suppress or hide? Is it talent that could help me meet the wizard if I make good? So I'll make good. So I got my little making good idea. <laughs> understand 
what's not working about it. Sometimes it takes a long time to figure it out, and you know, and don't be afraid to try something new, and yeah, and so on. Okay, I, I talked longer than I am, but we do have some time for some questions. So, um, yeah. I just wanted you to speak a little bit more about song form. Uh, we've grown up with the AABA and the ABAC is very prominent in theater, and now the verse chorus is a whole generation of younger people for whom that's the main way they hear music. And I've struggled with my collaborator to, to write in a more contemporary way. And I'm, I'm just wondering, do you have any secrets or do you struggle with <coughs> trying to include verse chorus in, in what you write? Or I, It's a great question. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, the, the biggest issue in theater, as I say, is to, is, is to stay ahead of the audience a little bit. The problem with verse chorus is that when you return to the chorus, you're, you haven't moved forward. Um, and, and, you know, as I say, I have a lot of songs that are, that are verse chorus, though I do it less and less, I have to say. But, you know, back in the Pippin days, Corner of the Sky, verse, verse chorus, verse chorus, verse chorus, end. You know, no time at all. Keep returning to the chorus. And there is a satisfaction of returning to the chorus because the audience gives the ear both a chance to rest and they, they come to someplace familiar. So, but the problem is, as I said, the sense of not moving forward. So you really want to, therefore, take a look at the, the verses if you're doing that form and you want to trick up the last chorus somehow. So there's some, you know, the kind of thing we talked about. Um, but really in terms of form, I think you want to try and walk that line of having a form the audience can grasp, so they're not like, what the hell is this song? I can <laughs> find my way. And, you know, we want to, we want to feel, we want to understand what the form is so we can relax in it, but you don't want it to be, to become predictable. You, so that's the trick, and I think if you keep that in mind, um, then whatever form you're working in, you know, you want, you want to apply that to it and, and in a way I think that will, that will take care of itself. Does that help? Somewhat? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, contemporary forms, sure, but you still want to be writing a theater song. They did it very successfully in Hairspray. There's a lot of response. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and yet those songs you know, you, you do constantly feel like, like they're, for the most part, the songs that are intended to move you forward really do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've written so many songs, and I'm sure that you can identify a certain bag of tricks that you have. How do you get past the bag of tricks when you come up with to something new? The question was, if you have a bag of tricks, how do you get past it to, to come up with something new? Um, that's, I mean, I just told you that. I'm, I'm trying to wean myself from the triple rhyme at the end of the song, because I've just done it so much. Because it works, right, you know. Right. Um, I think it's self-awareness, and, and trying to understand why you're using that particular, what, what are you trying to accomplish with that particular trick, and, um, and is there another way to do it? Uh, and, but, and it's just being aware that, that you're starting to repeat your, re repeat your tricks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm wondering if before we end today, we could have a sing-along with you. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like to say? Uh, you choose. But... <laughs> sure. <laughs> we'll sing the song and we'll sing okay. along. Perfect. I can remember how to play it. <laughs> And have it's 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 actually in, in reference to the, the question about you know a, one way of not repeating your bag of tricks is to steal other people. <laughs> and and it's exactly what you said. I you know early on I noticed that a lot of writers that I admired ha had these sort of uh, um, paradox titles, things that couldn't actually exist, um, but somehow we knew what they meant. And I was attracted to that, and so yeah, so I've tried to do that from 
consciously, I mean, Colors of the Wind is a conscious attempt, Corner of the Sky is another one, a conscious attempt at a title that doesn't actually make any sense. But because it's nonsense, has, it has like an extra layer of meaning um, that the audience brings to it. And that's just being conscious of, of trying to do that and, and, and searching for it. Yeah. Yeah. Can you comment on people who create shows without a musical theater background, a music background, but not a musical theater background? Um, yeah. Uh, they, a lot of successful, you know, Broadway shows people are... Not so much, actually. <laughs> not, not so many successful shows by um, people with music backgrounds and not musical theater backgrounds, unless somebody else involved with the show is, is, is smart theatrically. I mean, if you think about Billy Elliot, you know, you got Stephen Daldry there. So he's really smart, and he really knows how to tell a story, both in terms of uh, um, the, the book storytelling and how to tell a story directorially. So the songs, it, it lets the songs off the hook a little bit. Um, plus, plus they all, it also pushes the writer to, to think more theatrically. But yeah, I mean, think about you know, Paul Simon, just one of the most brilliant <coughs> songwriters you know, in my lifetime, who just you know, took on the Cape Man and just couldn't, didn't know how to tell a story theatrically. And this happens over and over again. You know, American Idiot. I mean, it's you, you. Generally, when they work, it's because somebody else is is really thinking theatrically. Uh, yes, here and then I'll go back and then I'll we'll do a sing along. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. I I know that generally we all like to think that. Uh, here's what I'm trying to say. I think some things just don't work for musicals. And when I was in New York recently, people went, Spider Man. Gee, what? I I, I said I don't think Spider Man has a musical in it. And I, I guess I also feel that way about Come Fly With Me. Now I know we could think of counterexamples, but do you, do you come across pieces and go, I, where's the musical? Or do you feel like anything could be made? Um, the, the answer to that question is both yes and no. Um, I don't necessarily agree. For instance, Spider-Man, I, I could see, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to musicalize that story because I'm not interested in it, right. but I could see someone who was really interested in that character, Peter Parker, and what he's struggling with, and whatever. Uh, th he's got a lot of stuff to sing about. Um, <laughs> so I could see how, it, how that idea could be a musical um, if somebody you, you know, found, found the way to do it, and, they re and it sang for them, and that's my answer. If it, if it, I mean, I've talked about 1776 yesterday, which is the worst idea for a musical I've ever heard, and one of my favorite musicals. It's just because somehow it sang for um, the uh, Sherman, I'm sorry, I forget his last name. Uh, who, who, Edwards. Sherman Edwards, thank you, Craig, who, who wrote the score and had the idea for it. And then Peter Stone found, wrote this amazing book, and suddenly it was a musical that, that worked um, because, because they heard it. But if you came to me and said, do you want to do a musical about the Declaration of Independence and writing it, I'd just tell you it's a terrible idea, and, and no, no, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I have a question about writing lyrics and collaborating with the composer, and I'm just curious about the, the extent to which the lyrics themselves, the structure of the lyrics, influence the way the music is written, and whether, uh, whether you, if you write the lyrics first, is that, to write it in mind to drive to a certain result from the composer, or is there a lot of back and forth then? That's a, you know that's a great question, and and you and and I'm going to answer it a little teeny bit, but that's something that you could write an entire book about. Um, that's that's such a key question. Um, I tend to when I'm working as a lyricist with another composer, frankly, I tend to work music first, partly out of laziness, um, but partly because I think music has its own internal logic and, and emotional logic that if you start with a lyric and aren't willing to twist it around a little bit you can you can f lose the the emotional logic that, that the music might have that being said counterintuitively i know that all of rogers and hammerstein story uh, songs were written lyrics first um, 
partly because Roger, uh, Oscar Hammerstein knew, you know, just the very things you're saying. I, I don't know to what extent Richard Rodgers changed things and cut things, etc. I know if I'm setting a lyric, I tend to be, it's like what we were talking about with adaptation yesterday. I tend to say like, you know what, I have to cut this line and this needs fewer words here and I need something extra here and, and go off of it a little bit. Um, so you have to be willing, I think, if you're the lyricist, to let the composer uh, run with it a little bit and then rewrite the lyric um, to fit it. Uh, I, I, a mistake that I made early in my career when I was working with Leonard Bernstein and I did do some of the lyrics first and after he set, and I of course had a little tune in my head to which I was writing those lyrics to give me a rhythmic shape, and when he set the lyrics, he set them in an entirely different, and I will say, far more imaginative way than, than I had thought of, but what I didn't do was go back and rewrite the lyric, which is what I should have done. Rewrite and, the music or the lyric? No, rewrite the, the lyric. Once the music existed, I should have gone back, and, and there were places where, it, where I could have made the, the lyric sit better on the music, fit the, the flow of the music better, um, call less attention to its own rhyme scheme, and so on. And I just didn't know enough to do it. So that's, that's what I would say, that, that it really is a partnership, and, and in the end, you want, that, you want the marriage of the music and lyrics to feel completely inevitable. Um, yeah, so, so then you want to be willing to go back and forth. I, I'll tell you one, one other quick story before I sing along. Um, <laughs> this, this was very interesting to me, too. When I was working on the show Rags with Charles Strauss, and he had written this really, I thought, beautiful tune. And, um, and I had written the lyric for it. Uh, and it was all, you know, it was fulfilling all the rules I thought about, moving the plot forward and all the stuff we talked about. Um, and we did it at some readings and backers auditions, just landing flat. And um, the tune, I don't even remember the original lyric, but um, the, 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 the character said, I, the original lyric was like, I will find a way. And, and the tune, she was singing, oh, I will find a way. And it just was like dying. And, uh, and then I did a whole other lyric to that tune, also not working at all. And finally Charles said, I guess we're just going to throw that out and write a different tune. And I just said, no, 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 it's, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> um, I just haven't solved this. I have to. It's a beautiful tune. And, and it's apropos of what we were talking about. Find a, find a title that doesn't actually mean anything literally, but means something more. And so I just said, I just have to go more anthem. The music is anthemic and poetic, and I just need to do that in a lyric way. And, and so I came up with the title, Children of the Wind. Um, and as soon as I uh, said that, I didn't practice this, so I'll probably do it wrong. But the, the, a little bit of the final lyric was, and this is a show about immigrants, and it was something about, uh, we're children. That's the most beautiful tune. And that was, no, and I loved that they did that. That, I thought, like, that's the fucking job of the lyric. So the tune is, is just beautiful. You know, I'll finish with this famous story that's probably apocryphal about Oscar Hammerstein and Jerome Kern. Do you know the story about Old Man River? The wife of Oscar Hammerstein and the wife of Jerome Kern are at a party. I'm sure this didn't really happen. And someone, and they're having to be standing together, and someone comes up to uh, them, and she says, Mrs. Kern, I just have to tell you that I, your husband is such a genius, and he wrote my favorite song, Old Man River. And Mrs. Hammerstein says, no, 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 dear. My husband wrote Old Man River. Her husband wrote, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from how funny that is, uh, but that's the job of the lyric. The job of the lyric is as soon as you put the 
turn the phrase Old Man River to that, then the music just, just comes to life. So you have to be looking for that when you collaborate. All right, we're doing a sing-along. Um, <laughs> who, uh, is, there, is there a female voice here who can sing day by day? Come here, because I, I don't want to, because it'll get all confusing if I play it in my key, and then nobody will be able to sing along. So great, great. <laughs> Backup vocals. Okay. <laughs>